Good morning, TFF. Um, it's Sunday morning. Today is the 26th of March. It's just about 10 to 12 now. And I thought I'd start the week off because you've got two lectures from me this week. You've got um, second language acquisition theories and you've also got communicative language teaching. So you've got a double whammy for being second language fellow teachers because you need to know about acquisition theories when you try and teach a second language to your students. Okay, so I'm going to share my my PowerPoint with you. So let's go to it. Uh, let's just see the second language acquisition, share, slide share with you as well. Okay, so hope you're all doing well. Um, bit of rain we've had this morning, beautiful rainbow early this morning. We need really need a lot more because we're nearly ground zero here at in Port Elizabeth. And whereas I see most of the country is having downpours, so we really need that in our in our section, the Eastern Cape. There we go. Um, this is 3.1, week 3.1. Um, we're going to look at the difference between learning a language and acquiring a language. So maybe by the end of this learning event, you will know how we learn and how we acquire a language. Acquiring is more a natural acquisition of a language. How did you learn Isikosa? How did you learn Afrikaans? How did you learn English um, without actually being taught the language as well? Passion is one of the theorists we're going to look at this, this afternoon as well. Um, and he says language acquisition, how we acquire language, does not require extensive use of conscious grammatical rules. So to learn a language, you don't need to know how to work the third person singular or what a pronoun is, those of you that love parts of speech or what an abstract noun is. You don't need that. It's no conscious learning with it. You just acquire it and it does not require tedious drills. That means you don't have to go into worksheet after worksheet after worksheet to acquire the drill. I st I've taught um, English first traditional language for quite a long time and I know a lot of the students acquire the rule and then they go and write their essays and they get it all wrong. So they've learned the rule, but they haven't been able to apply it into their reading and into their speaking. Okay. So we don't need rules to acquire a language and we don't need drills in the classroom. This is just a roundup of what we've done in week two. Um, the online tracking task two closes on the 2nd of April. The online reflection task closes tonight, 26th of March at midnight. Um, please get that in. Uh, we're going to look at your menti.com textbook survey. I'm going to look at that in my next um, lecture, the 3.2 communicative language teaching with you this afternoon. Um, then the menti.com task completed, which no one's done. I'm not too sure. I'm going to show you to this afternoon how to go to menti and how to complete the task. Hopefully that'll, hopefully that'll help you because you've got more to do for, with this one. You have to go and do a little menti task as well. And I'm also going to look at Olani case study which I'll ask you to uh, consider the answers this afternoon um, because that's why Kikulani speak the language so well, but he can't actually read and write it very well. Thinking of Cummins' Bix and Kelp model as well to help us answer that question. Okay, let's look at my little statistical um, understanding of FETs. I went into um, Canvas again this morning and I see there's 63 of you that are now registered. Reflection task, 30 of you have completed it now. Um, it's still in red because you haven't reached the 50% the um, stage yet. I need about 35 to do it before I can change you to black. And I can see eight of you have already started on the um, the quiz two, the one on curriculum documents. Um, SP is 108, but um, Natalie will speak to you about your statistics. Yes, it makes me a bit, feel a bit frightened when I look at that, but I know by the end of tonight, I'll be quite relaxed and I'm going to have some black figures coming into my, my spreadsheet here. Yes, unit one, we, we've, we've looked at different aspects of teaching methodologies. In week one, we looked at principles of language teaching. Week two, we looked at both interrogating the CAPS document and the curriculum documents for language teaching. That's done. Um, this afternoon, we're looking at language acquisition theories. Chapter four um, in Ferreira, you really need Ferreira. Um, in my next lecture, I'll show you, I think it's only about 11 of you that have got Ferreira. I just really don't know how you do in this course if you don't have Ferreira. Okay, it's gonna be difficult. 
Yes, how do we acquire language? There's the little baby, there's the adult. How do we get from being that baby to the adult and how we speak? And most of the time, it's not about learning the language. It's about acquiring it. I don't think you can consciously remember when I went to learn Afrikaans or English. Or was a, um, I did that at university. I did Isi Zulu. So it was more of a learning, but it was also a bit of an acquisition process that I went through to learn Isi Zulu. So today's um, outline, we're going to first look at the language acquisition order. What do we first acquire when we acquire a language? What aspect of the language? Um, in difficulty, right down to the last one, we look at that order. We look at behaviorism, innatism, interactionalism. These are all mentioned in chapter four. So I will go over it, give you an overview of each of these, um, but you can also read up in Pereira. And then we're going to finish off with Krashen's second language acquisition theories. He's got five hypotheses on how we acquire a second language. These are all quite interesting too. So let's go to with Larson Freeman, who's quite a literacy um, theorist of note um, in the literacy world. What she says, how we actually, the order of our grammatical morphine acquisition um, when we teach, when we're learning English. And if it's in a natural setting, like in the home, okay, so... You, you, from a child, a baby, you're in the home and how you acquire it till you go to school, varsity and so on. This is a natural setting without actually being physically taught the language. The first thing that you acquire as a child is the tense ing, the continuous tense. You'll say, I'm sleeping, I'm jumping, I'm running, um, I'm playing. Okay, so that's the kind of way you will speak. If you're young, you'll acquire that tense very easily. Um, third person singular is further down the list. Um, that is normally quite difficult. So he, she, it, um, he sleeps, she sleeps, it sleeps. Okay, so the, how do we use that third person singular um, when we're using a noun after it? Um, John sleeps, Mary sleeps, okay? It sleeps. Then the last one is the possessive, the use of apostrophe. That seems to be the most difficult to acquire. If you look at that list, from the easiest to the most difficult. So if you're getting the apostrophe all wrong, that's not really a problem because it's quite the most difficult thing to use. Is it for possessive or is it showing that there is a letter omitted when it's been used? And a lot of people can't differentiate between that. In the class setting, when you're going to school to learn how to speak English or how to learn English, um, it seems like the third person singular is people acquire that a lot easier when they've been taught it. Then comes the continuous tense. And finally, still the most difficult is the possessive. So even when you're learning at school, learning the possessive is going to be quite a problem. I think even in adults, when I look at them, I can see they're also battling. So we need to understand how this little possessive works. He has a little nice cartoon, which says the use of apostrophes. Now, if you look at that, um, is it correct or is it incorrect? Should there be an apostrophe there before the S? If it's plural, would you put an apostrophe there or would you not? So the use of the apostrophes, is it showing possession or is it showing there's a letter omitted or should there be no apostrophe at all? Okay, think about that. You can do a little quiz now. Okay. So there's a good apostrophe use. It's when it's got the apostrophe and means that I'm, it's a shortened form. I'm showing, using the apostrophe to show that there is a letter left out, okay? Always stands for it is, all right? So the I has been omitted or it has, okay? You'd use the it's. So for instance, it's great weather. We say and then say it is great weather. It's been, it's been great being here. We say it's because it's instead of saying it is. All right. There we go. Great weather. Okay. Good being here. Always, that's always summer. The possessive form, it's never has an apostrophe. So if there is an omission of a letter, there is an apostrophe. If there isn't and you're showing possession, then you don't have an apostrophe. So the dog, dog chase its tail, no apostrophe. The elephant squirted water on its head. No apostrophe. All right. Let's see how you go with this little quiz. Spot the problem. Would you use an apostrophe when writing plural such as DVD? I can't see what else. TVs, PCs, and CVs. Okay. If you're using a plural form, 
would you use an apostrophe? Is it correct to say CVs or should it be CV apostrophe? Right, what do you think? No, you don't use it. There's the cross, you don't use it. Um, which of the following plurals are written correctly? And then we've got specials. And this is your specials. Avos at $6.99 each, that's quite cheap. Beans at $4.95, $59 a kilogram, and tomatoes at $8.99 a kilogram. Okay. Is the use of apostrophe correct here? When you're saying there are specials, avos, beans, and tomatoes, which one is correct? Yes, beans is because all the rest shouldn't have the apostrophe because they're all plurals. So you would not have a, a apostrophe with specials, you would not have it with avos, and you would not have it with tomatoes. Here's another quiz. Which of the following plurals are correct? Tomatoes or tomatoes with apostrophe? Video, videos. Ever or evers? Grade 12s or grade 12s? MPs or MPs with apostrophe? And banana or bananas? Okay, which one's correct? Yes, only the ones on the left are correct. Don't put an apostrophe in when you've got a plural. All the others are incorrect. Okay, that's order and looking at apostrophe. We look at behaviorism now. You can see I put page 46 in. Page 46 there, that's all from Pereira. So behaviorism says we pour the knowledge into the skull. Okay, there it is, education. Open the head and we pour in. So that's how people gain knowledge. Okay, sometimes you think that might be the way, but it's not really the way. So this is how behaviorism works. First of all, there's imitation, so you copy. So your teachers say, I am running. And the whole class says, I am running. He is jumping. They all copy her all the time. This re repetition type thing, which is very a mark of behaviorism. I think your teachers, some of your teachers might have been taught like that. That's what they do. It's called the received tradition. They would teach like they were taught. Please don't do that. You can copy till you're blue in the face and you're not going to gain, acquire the language. Practice. You repeat it all the time as if you do all those workshop, workshops, worksheets um, with lists and you do many, many worksheets. Is it going to give you the, the acquisition of the, the actual language? Positive reinforcement. Yes, all those praises. Well done, John. Well done, Ayanda. Lelwa, well done. Um, and the other characteristic is habit forming. Again, repeating things. So if you repeat enough, Behaviorism says you will acquire the language. Brooks and them took it a bit further um, in 1960 and Lado in 1964, and they were emphasizing mimicry. Can you see the behaviorism? Mimicking, imitating, memorization. That's the audio lingual method to memorize the rules of grammar. Okay, mimic them, copy them. Did that lead to second language acquisition? So they use language drills, repeating language structures to try and make them automatic and habitual. And I think a lot of people have resorted to this way to help students to acquire a language. Please just note that this is not going to help your learners. So if you're drilling them, trying to make them memorize things and trying to copy you, they're not actually going to be very good English second language learners because this is not the way you acquire a language. This is all behaviorism, page 46. This does not explain this mimicking, copying, repeating, practicing does not explain how children are able to say things they've never heard. So how can I say something I've never heard and create logical mistakes if I haven't been copying it or mimicking it or practicing it? So think about these mistakes that children make. They say there were lots of mices. Okay. Where would they have heard that before? We wouldn't say that. We'd say there are lots of mice. Mice. Okay, not mices. Hold it. I holded this. Okay. Not I held. Right. They're using the ED past tense form. They've never heard someone say, I holded this, but they say it. They've added the ED to it. I swimmed. Not I swam. They would hear swam, but they've added the ED for past tense. Where do they hear that? I've got lots of tooths. Okay. Instead of teeth. So they use that incorrectly, but the rule is there and they've never heard it. So where did they acquire that? Look at this lovely cartoon. Um, the boy's helping his mother set the table. And he says, I put it the plates on the table. I put it the plates on the table. She says to him, you mean I put the plates on the table. 
He says, no, I put them all on myself. Okay, so he's keeping, he's put it in that sense. He didn't get this from his mom because she would say, I put it, right? And he took it that, no, I put it on. So that's the natural mistake, which behaviorism can't actually explain. So innatism means it's all in your mind. This is also in Avera, page 47. You're going to read up about it. And this comes from Chomsky. These all go right back to 1959. He argues that behaviorism cannot give sufficient explanations for how children acquire language for the following reasons. And as I said, that innate behaviorism cannot tell us how kids can come up with these errors. They've never, ever heard them. So... For these reasons, that children know more about language structure than they could learn based on what they hear. So they're not hearing about put it or hold it or swimmed. All right. They've not heard that. How did they make that rule? Here's another thing. Children are exposed to language that includes false starts, incomplete sentences. I've used wrong words here today as well. I've fluffed up a few things. Um, and if children are hearing this kind of language all the time, but even in spite of that, they can distinguish between grammatically correct and incorrect sentences. They can actually correct things even when they're being exposed to bad language. All right. So they are not corrected and yet they know. And then finally, children are not systematically corrected and instructed on by on language by their parents. So their, their mother, this little in the cartoon, the previous cartoon, the mother tried to say, I put. But often parents will just leave their children to make the errors, knowing that they will they will correct them. They think they're quite cute. I think I've got a list of all the, the mistakes my children made um, because I thought they were so cute. I never, ever corrected them to say it correctly. Yes, we don't correct our kids when they make that mistake. I'm sure if your parents corrected you every time you made an error, you'd soon get fed up with them as well because you will acquire the correct grammatical rule eventually. So what about acquisition? Are we born to use language? There's the baba, okay, and grown up. So as we are born, can we use language? So this comes with innatism still, which sees it as a sequence that children are biologically programmed for language. It's something within our DNA. As children, we acquire language. And you know that if children are exposed to many languages at a certain age, they will actually acquire them all. So language develops in the child in the same way as our other biological functions will develop. So first of all, we learn to speak as we learn to walk. So it's a natural thing. We are programmed to learn to speak. We are programmed to learn to walk from sitting to crawling to walking. This all happens. Um, so this brings us to the language acquisition device, the LAD, um, that we've got all this innate ability within us. Okay, it's like a black box, this, this thing that we've got, which is language within us. And this black box contains universal, universal grammatical principles that apply to human languages. So there's a black box. We carry a ball with this black box. And inside this box is a whole lot of rules that we have innately got. All we need to do to acquire this language is to activate this language that's inside of us by being exposed to language. So we've got this box, we've brought this box, and to activate it, I have to expose you to language. So I've got to take this baby and expose him to language, and that universal grammar will be activated from that box. So the innatism said children will automatically begin to acquire language of the environment. If they are exposed to language, they will acquire the language of the where whatever it might be. Sometimes it might be two languages, but sometimes it might be three languages. However, this LAD, this language acquisition device, must be activated during a critical period for language, and that's often before puberty. So you'll see that adults find it a lot harder to learn another language. When I was in the UAE, I really battled with Arabic because I'm old, and to learn a new language, especially when it's like a sign language, was very, very difficult. I don't even think... Uh, quite very much. I know things are halas, okay, um, or I um, can't even think of another word at the moment, but my I battle to learn Arabic. I started picking up certain words that we use all the time, but I battled with acquiring because I'm so old, okay. If I'd gone to the UAE and started hearing Arabic when I was about five or four, it might have been a lot easier. So 
this is some lots of evidence to support innatism and we've got the black box and we need to be exposed to language to activate it so it was virtually all children successfully learn their mother tongue because they're exposed to language in their mother tongue all the time in a life in their life when they were really not expected to do so because it is so complicated so therefore we biologically programmed to acquire language with activating a lad okay according to innatism so if you think about kids and i'm sure those of you got your own children or you've got brothers and sisters you'll know that babies at three months are cooing and gurgling six months they start babbling maybe start to say ba ba da da okay 12 months they start saying their first words um one of my friends has got a baby boy of about eight months he's not really saying very much but he is making a lot of cooing and gurgling sounds i think at the moment at 18 months you know about five to 40 words by two years 150 to 300 words um but by the time you get to five years you start to identify letters um, you can create longer sentences. At four years, you've got about 2,000 words and you can make five word sentences. So can you see how this, how we grow in our mother tongue because we're exposed to language all the time? So how this universal grammar works for second language acquisition? How does it work for that? There are two different views for this. Um, first is that this universal grammar that we've got within us in the black box is available to language two learners are second language learners but its exact nature has been altered by the prior acquisition of the first language so because you've got english or is it koza or is it zulu or afrikaans as our first language this often interferes with our second language acquisition before because i can speak is zulu doesn't mean i'm going to easily acquire my second language especially if i'm not exposed to it before that puberty time so Often language to our uh, second language, our FAL students need some explicit information of what is not grammatical in our L2. So we've got our L1 and often we, we don't understand how it translates into our L2. I'm just going to use a Zulu example that I know with the use of the pronoun U, Ufunda. U can mean male or female. All right. The problem is when you go to English, you've got he and she. She learns, he learns are two different things. So you can't say to a female, he learns. Whereas you could say in Isizulu, Ufunda, all right? Read or learn, okay? So that then I had the teacher's got to say, look, in English, you must say he learns and she learns, and you can't mix the two of them up. Okay, those kind of errors. Um, otherwise, they are going to make a problem. People won't understand what they're talking about. They're calling a female, a he, and a male, a she. Um, because some structures do not have equivalence in the L2. So if you've got a rule for L1, that's not necessarily going to be the rule for L2, as I've explained to you with the use of Ufunda. Look at Afrikaans and English. Um, in English, we say trees, okay? But we don't say worms in Afrikaans, okay? We say worma. So can you see how the, the use of the plural in English might interfere with Afrikaans. We don't say flichtoichs, okay, because that's the plural in English, aeroplanes, or flichtoichs, making it like that way, we don't say that. We should rather say flichtoichs, okay, which is aeroplanes, okay, so can you see there can be interference, um, and Afrikaans people will maybe soon correct you and say it's not worms, it's boema, or it's flichtoichs, so you'd get the correction you might get, an, if I call, um, if I say it, she instead of a he, someone who's English speaking might say, no, that's actually she, it's not a he. So you'd get corrected. Number four, remember the five theories we're going to look at? Interactionism on page 47 in Ferreira. Believe that children learn the L1, their first language, through a combination, not just the innate, but all the environment. So it's not just what's inside of us, the black box. We need an environment. And I think innatism says that a little because it activates, the environment activates the language. So children have an inborn capacity to develop language. Okay, and this is quite crucial. And, but not only that innate ability, but also the language the child hears from adults or people in his or her world. So we don't just need the innate, we do, that's crucial, but we also need the environment where we hear the language all the time. So 
I once was um, in the United States in a class where there were a lot of Chinese trying to learn English and was totally silent. Um, they obviously have the ability to hear the language and learn the language, but they never actually heard it in the environment because there was no speaking, no interaction was happening. So I'm sure when they finished this English language speaking course, I'm sure many of them weren't much better in able to speak it because nothing was being activated in the environment. So by the time of primary education, so when our students reach um, grade R and grade one, and they've, they've acquired their L1, whether it be Isi Zulu, Isi Sutu, um, English, Afrikaans, French, German, Russian. Um, but when they enter school, they're going to be hearing sometimes a second and a third additional language that they've never heard before. So at home, they've only heard Afrikaans possibly in the environment. They reach school and they hear people speaking English, Afrikaans, Isuzu, Greek, French, um, and most of them have not acquired that. So they will not understand the L2. And this is how the acquisition will start working. So we get on to the last theorist, which is Krashen, Stephen Krashen. Um, he brought this to, to English, the theory of second language acquisition in 1982. And you can read about that in on page 48 to 50 in, in your textbook, Ferreira. There's your five hypotheses. It's the acquisition learning hypothesis. It's the monitor hypothesis, how we learn the natural order hypothesis. We came across this with Larson Freeman. The input, what we hear, what, what information is given to us hypothesis and the effective filter hypothesis, which means how our, our emotions and our feelings might impact on us learning a second language. These are the, all the monitors there, Krashen's hypothesis from the learning versus acquisition versus learning, all the way to the effective filter hypothesis. Interesting man, this Stephen Krashen. Um, this is what he says. Remember, he said in on, on our first cover slide, you don't need to know rules to learn a language. You don't have to do drills to learn a language. Let's see what he says about acquisition. How do we acquire language? He says we need to have meaningful interaction in the target language. And this is where communicative language teaching comes in, where we're going to be looking at in, in our 3.2 lecture. So to acquire a language, you have to have meaningful interaction in the class using the target language. So the teacher must give the students time to use English within the classroom, natural, authentic communication. This is not worried about how the form of the sentence is used or the way that speaking takes place. So in which speakers are not concerned about the form of the utterances. They're not worried about they're going to make a mistake, but they are concerned about the messages being understood. And this is what CLT is all about, that we give our students lots of opportunities to speak the language, but we don't correct them all the time, as long as we can understand what they are saying. If they're saying, I'm playing, I understand what they're saying. I don't just say, I am playing. It makes no difference if, they, if you say it like that. But we allow them to speak even if the utterances are not correct, as long as you can understand it and your friends can understand them. Those are quite important things to remember. Right, so we're going to look at each of these five very quickly. So acquisition is a subconscious process. When you acquire a language, you don't physically go and sit down at your desk and you learn it. You acquire it by hearing people talking about it and so on. I had a Chinese girl from mainland China staying with a group of my students here. She couldn't speak a word of English when she when she arrived in South Africa. She chose to stay with students who couldn't speak Chinese. By the end of her fourth year, she was speaking Afrikaans as well as English because she acquired the language. It was subconscious. No one physically went and spoke to her and taught it to her. She learned it when she was acquiring as they would have acquired their first language. So learning is different. It's like when you go and do second language acquisition and you go and learn how to speak Greek, like I try to learn to speak Arabic. Learning is the product of formal instruction. What are you formally instructing your learners in? And remember, according to Bix and Kelp and Cummins' model, that's often the top of the iceberg, which soon melts away. That's at those rules that you're learning. This is the conscious process. When you learn the rule for writing things in the past tense, you learn the rules for doing the, the active, passive, direct and indirect speech. And this is resulting in conscious knowledge about the language. How do I write something in the passive? How do I write it in the active? How do I write direct speech? How do I write indirect speech? Um, these are all things that we consciously learn. So you've got the learning and we've got the acquisition subconscious. 
and conscious. Then you've got the monitor hypothesis, which is all about correcting or not correcting. So monitor, it's like a monitored school, prefect, explains the relationship between acquisition and learning and defines the influence of learning on acquisition. What we learn, how does that impact on what, how we acquire a language? If I get corrected all the time about my grammar rules, is that going to make me acquire the language better? So monitor checks and corrects the language as the students are trying to learn. So every time they make an error or they write an essay and you put all those crosses and you write all the things, you are being the monitor there. You're checking and you're correcting things. All one speakers monitor. If you're a first language speaker, you monitor without even being aware of it. Okay, I monitor all the time. Um, because you've got an awareness of the language and a feel for correctness when you send that WhatsApp, like I've done, and you, oh my word, I use you instead of your, um, you monitor that. No one says to you, go and check that. You know, as a mother tongue speaker, what is right and wrong. You've got a natural monitor inside of you, so you go and correct things. Uh, if you say something incorrectly, like I've monitored myself quite a few times in this lesson, when I've realized I've used the wrong word, I've said the wrong thing, and then you monitor it and you correct it. You can't help it. You just do it. So all two speakers have to know the grammar rule to be able to do that. They don't know the that, as I said, the burma and booms. Um, they have to, I have to learn when I'm learning Afrikaans that it's burma and not booms. I've got to learn the rule. Um, so once they know the grammar rule, they can consciously repair what they are doing while speaking. But if they haven't got the grammar rule and they haven't acquired it, they're going to keep on making those mistakes, all right? Because they don't have the rule to repair. Yes, this is hard work when you're learning a second language and someone says to you, don't pronounce it like that. You don't say advertisement. You say advertisement. And the next thing you say, advertisement again. Um, it's very hard work to repair because you've got to think about it and you've got to try and do it properly and you've got to practice it. So it's hard work to repair all the time, whereas if it's your mother tongue, you do it automatically and it's not hard. Um, I can really repair my punctuation. I can repair my pronunciation. I can repair my spelling because I can see that I've spelled something incorrectly. So you've got to think about it. It's hard work. Um, and if you monitor someone all the time, it's hard for them. But you will, as a mother tongue speaker, monitor yourself all the time if, if you've written something incorrectly. Right, this is Krashen's third, the natural order hypothesis, as we did with Larson Freeman in the beginning. There is a natural order, is based on research findings from Dulay and Bird 1974, suggested that the acquisition of grammatical structures follows a natural order, which is predictable. So if I'm learning my English um, as a second language, I start with ing. Okay, that's the easiest one. It's said for the natural setting as well. And forming the plural is quite early. And then you start using a uh, and the correctly. And finally, the possessive. So it's from ing, plurals, article use, a uh, and the. And finally, the possessive will be the last thing you're going to learn. So that is the tricky bit. Okay, again, we have the possessive, the use of the apostrophe. The sequence is similar across all language learning and makes it predictable. So it's not just for... um any environment, it seems to be quite a predictable order that they've researched to see this is how we acquire language. Um, this is a natural order and teachers can use sequence language teaching activities. So I can start with the, the ING continuous tense because that's the one they've all acquired and I'll have to build up to the possessive because that's the one that's going to be the most difficult for my learners. So this is the order according to Brown in 1973. If I'm learning if I'm an English 1 student, I'm going to start with that ing, the continuous tense. It's, it's predictable. There's the plural. There's the irregular past tense. And the possessive comes in. So if I'm a mother tongue speaker, I soon learn how to use the possessive. Then I use the to be correctly, the a uh and the an, the the, the articles. Third person singular present tense seems to be a problem. He runs. She runs. It runs. Okay. People seem to make that much problematic. The auxiliary, the is, are, were, and was, we're not Afrikaans people battle with. If I'm a language two student, okay, this is a bit different according to Dulay and Bert. Um, the plural S is the easiest for them. Okay, runs, sleeps, okay. Then the continuous tense comes next. 
Um, and if you go all the way down the list, you'll see there is a third person singular. It's at number seven if I'm a mother tongue speaker, but it's number eight if I'm a language two speaker. Can you see there's a natural order sequence? They might not be exactly the same, but it's the same order. And there we go, voila, the possessive is the hardest. Whereas if I'm a mother tongue speaker, it's number four. But you can see all of these appear in the natural sequence of how we acquire a language and what's difficult in grammar. This is the input hypothesis also from Krashen. Um, input explains how learners acquire the second language. How do we acquire, what input do we have to have inside of us into our brains that we can actually gain that knowledge? So learners improve and progress along this natural order from the continuous tense all the way to the possessor when they receive second language input or comprehensible input. Krashen calls this comprehensible input when I get that from the teacher. Now, what is that? That means I must, mustn't just teach them easy stuff all the time. I've got to teach them the I plus one, something that's slightly difficult. So I don't just teach them the rule. I teach them maybe the exceptions to the rule so that they've got something that's a bit more complicated. If I give them I plus two, then that is far above their ability. Maybe doing the exceptions to the rule might be too far above their ability and it's too difficult for them to comprehend, um, and therefore they might just give up. Maybe with me learning Arabic, I think the biggest problem was I really battled with them writing um, the symbols of Arabic on the board when they were explaining something to me, and I couldn't actually understand anything about that. If they wrote it um, phonetically, I could understand the words there. So I just gave up as well because it became too difficult for me. So the hypothesis suggests that to be fluent is not something that can be explicitly taught. So I cannot just give him all this input. I've got to give him I plus one and not teach them anything explicitly to be fluent. Remember, rather to have a communicative language teaching environment where they are using meaningful language and you're not correcting them all the time. So if you look at this lovely image, I plus two, yes, it's too difficult. Can you see how the agony is on that face? I plus one is just fine. It's a bit hard, but you can acquire it. I plus zero person is sleeping and bored um, because it is just so boring. You are doing things that are far too easy for your learners. You've got to build up to the I plus one. Okay, so this has been criticized, this input hypothesis, as it's just that learners are passively getting input, okay, without actively being engaged in the language and providing output. So you can't just pour this into their heads like that, that cut the brain off and pour it in. And they must just sit and listen and absorb. Okay, maybe also in my Arabic, they can give us enough time to practice pronunciations, talking to each other. Um, I have to be able to be actively engaged with it as well. And I must give output. I must actually speak back. I must write back. I must read aloud. I must do something. So learners need to listen and read. Not only listen all the time, but they also possibly need to read. They also need to speak but they also need to write okay so the input is the listening and the reading so i'm listening to you so therefore i must then speak i must also do something i'm reading is quite passive but then i must write i'm going to show the output so we don't only give them input all the time by listening and reading to me the teacher i'm also giving the learners a chance to speak and to write so we're not going to be passive learners where they just have to listen and read no we're not those kind of teachers we're getting the students up to the board. We're getting them to do work out things. We're getting to working groups so they can become active learners. This is quite a nice little, which we can look at cognitive levels as well. Yes, the top of the pyramid is passive learning. And if you look at all the things for passive learning, it's lecturing. It's what I'm doing here. That's why I prefer you to um, Pereira all the time. I give you these little tasks. It's also about reading. It's about audiovisual. As we get into demonstration, remember the Bix and the Kelp um, models, the quadrants, demonstration is becoming more abstract. Um, so it's becoming more cognitively demanding. So we're going to avoid lecturing, reading, um, audiovisual. We're going to rather go towards demonstrating, discussing. Those are important. Practice doing, yes, group work, teaching others. All those ways are ways we can become more active and have output not only input from the teachers we are encouraging our students to have output okay the last hypothesis is the effective filter um, 
Effective is my feelings. Um, if I'm motivated, if I'm scared, if I'm anxious, how does this play a role in SLA? If you are a very scary teacher and you're shouting all the time, you might find that your effective filter in your class is very high. And um, whether you're a maths teacher, geography teacher, NS teacher, if you've got a very strict persona, um, you might find that none of your students can learn in your class. And if you think back to your time at school, what kind of teacher did you learn best in? I'm sure it wasn't the teacher that was strict and cross and angry all the time because you might have had a very, which you felt threatening, you, the effective fault is high and therefore often this doesn't help learning to happen. So these filters include motivation. Are they motivated? Are you saying, well done, Ayanda? Do they have self-confidence? These are positive things. Or is it anxiety when they walk into your classroom? They are terrified of English and the teacher. They are not going to be very good students and they're not going to learn very much. So learners with a high motivation, they want to learn. They want to come to your class because it's interesting and fun. They've got confidence because they feel that they're doing well and they've got a good self-image because you give it to them. You make them feel special and the anxiety levels are low. They are better equipped for success in second language acquisition. So think about yourself as a teacher. Are you reducing anxiety? Are you promoting motivation and a good self-image in your class? You're not belittling or being angry or horrible to your students. Yes, they're all happy. There they are interacting nicely in the class. So if you've got, on the other hand, low motivation, you don't want to learn English, low self-esteem, you're feeling lack of confidence, you, you've got your ego is small, you're, you're feeling um, oppressed, introverted, and you're full of anxiety. Um, this erases the effective filter and forms a mental block, um, which prevents comprehensible input from being used for acquisition. So if the teacher is using comprehensible input, remember that's I plus one, um, and there's anxiety in your class and the students are all very, very demotivated and don't have any self-esteem. I'm afraid nothing's going to happen in your class. They're not going to actually be able to achieve in your class um, because they're going to have this mental block. Think about you in any of your class. I had a bit of that in my maths class because I was terrified of my maths teacher. I really battled with math because I was more afraid of the teacher rather than learning what I was supposed to be learning, the maths, which I loved. Um, so think about yourself, how you are ensuring that there's no mental blocks in your class, okay, because students are so anxious. Do they feel like this when they walk in to do a quiz for you? Oh, I read this last night, but I can't remember the answer. What was that? Oh, no, no, no. This whole anxiety um, trauma that we feel when you walk into classes. And I'm sure you've all had teachers that have made you feel like this. Yes, stress, anxiety, confusion. Um, all those things that actually go through your head and you will not acquire your second language and be meaningful EFL, SP and FET students if you don't help your students to get the anxiety down. So what raises it? Blocks the learning. So if you've got a very scared, anxious student, learning will be blocked. If it's lowered, you've got self-confident, happy and increases learning. So this affects a filter. And I really believe in the use of this filter um, to keep it low all the time so learning can happen. Right, questions model, quickly overview. So we've got comprehensible input, again, I plus one, not I plus two, not I plus naught. We've got the effective filter. Look at it there, the scary man. Hey? And you can see how it blocks learning acquisition. So if we've got the scary layer in our class, language acquisition is going to be blocked. Students are not going to learn. Then we've also got the acquired knowledge that we've got by going through learn language acquisition. But we've also got the learned knowledge, the, 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 some of the rules, some of the ways to do things. We also have that because that gives us the monitor. We can ask, correct ourselves, correct our friends. Um, we can read something, we can say something and correct ourselves so we can monitor it. So eventually we will have output, which makes sense. And this is how our second language students, according to Krashen, will go through the whole process from comprehensible input Low um, effective filter causing language acquisition, they will acquire the language and they'll be able to monitor their correctness so they can speak comprehensively, output in their writing, in their speaking, and everything they do. Okay, you're going to do a bit of a mentee quiz on language learning, and there's going to be four questions I'm posing here for you. It's a true or false. I'm going to stop my share and show you what it looks like on 
my mentee, and you're gonna to have to say is this true or false. So the first question is, languages are learned mainly through imitation by copying. Is that true or false? Number two, all children acquire language regardless of circumstances. Is that true or false? Three, the most important factor in SLA success is motivation. Exactly, is that we've got motivated students or they acquire SLA? And number four, learners' errors should be corrected immediately to prevent the formation of bad habits. Okay, so is that true or false? Okay, I'm going to stop my share and show you what it looks on look, looks like on my mentee. I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going into Canvas. This is week three Canvas. You should be able to see it. Um, I'm going to scroll down uh, right to here. Yeah, is what I'm talking about. Menti quiz, how do people acquire language? It's the access one, this one right at the bottom. Um, if you click on that, I hope you're going to see this now, you will see a menti meter. And this is how you do all my mentees. You'll see a menti meter emerging. And all you're going to do is you're going to, this is false will be on the left and true will be on the other side. You can slide it across. So if you think it's only in the middle, you put it there, you're not sure or you think it's false, these are all false at the moment. If you move it across, it'll all be there. So go into your Mentimeter, click on it, and then answer that for me. Okay, I'm going to stop my share here, and I'm going to go back to my original. I hope you're all going to see this. There we go. Okay, those are the four questions. Click on the week three Mentimeter. How do people acquire language and see if you can answer those four questions? I don't know who you are, so please just try it. And I'm going on to my last slide now. Here's the Mentimeter that I showed you just now. Here it is. And what's next? Um, we're going to look at CLT, Communicative Language Teaching. That's your 3.2. Um, we're going to move from Second Language Acquisition into CLT, and this also has, this is also important because it's all about your assignment one as well. We're looking at CLT practices in the classroom. So it's now just after half past 12, I'm saying good afternoon, I'll chat to you later today um, with your CLT um, learning event. Okay, have a lovely Sunday, bye for now. Ending it now, bye.